Hey everyone, welcome to My Final Play. I'm Brian, I'm here on location with Karate Grandmaster George Beerman. George, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thank you Brian, appreciate it. So, we're going to get into the uh, the sport of karate, okay. uh, the art of karate. Um, obviously, being a Grandmaster, it has multiple levels, um, but really we'll go back to the beginning for you as okay. far as how you got started in it, and uh, okay. give us a little background on that. Sure. Um, actually... <laughs> I started uh, martial arts in 1973. Yeah, probably a little longer than you you are. You've been around a little bit. Before, yeah. maybe that's all right. So uh, you know, I mean, I wrestled. I played football. I was in gym team, track, that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. and I I I I was always a team player. However, I liked being. Uh, I guess rewarded on my own merits, yeah. you know, because I was a wrestler, you know, and, and that right. kind of thing. So when I went to college, I was actually supposed to wrestle and play football, and I didn't do either. And, you know, I guess I was more or less worried about my grades, so I wound up uh, getting into martial arts. Uh, I went to Bloomsburg, and there was a martial arts club there, and it was Taekwondo. Okay. So I started training under Taekwondo, and I, I really liked it. So I, I was at Bloom, of course, for four years, and then towards the end, uh, I think I got as high as a green belt mm -hmm. when I graduated. And then they, it, it was Young Brothers out of Philadelphia, and then they, it became International Taekwondo. So that's what I, I first trained in. Mm -hmm. So then when I got out of college, I came home to Williamsport here, and uh, a lot of the, my friends were taking martial arts in town here. They're, they're studying an Okinawan Kempo style. And once you start in one style, you kind of become prejudiced to that style. So, yeah. you know, so I, I, and I had trained with Joe Bragg in the summers, you know, I would come and train with him here. And my friends were telling me they were training with this other guy. And I said, well, why in the world are you training there? Why don't you train with Joe Bragg? I said, he's pretty good. So, well, we're already here. So why don't you come? And I said, well, all right. So finally they talked me into coming in and I trained there and I think I got as far as my, either my purple belt or my brown belt. Mm -hmm. And we, it, it just wasn't really going anywhere. And I, I finally said, look, you know, this, I'm not learning anything from this guy. So, so we wound up going to Joe Bragg. So there were three of us, myself and two of my friends, and we left and, and started training with Joe Bragg. And that's called Goshen Jitsu Kyojujo. Okay. okay, which is Japanese with a Chinese influence. So I trained uh, trained with him, and I, I'm still there. I mean, I have my own system and style, but I still train with Joe Bragg. I'm the head instructor for the local school. Okay. Um, and then as far as, you know, after you got into it, and like you said, that individuality of it, um, when did it really start progressing then to get to that next level or those next well, levels? Well, it, it was funny because because uh, I can't remember the dates, it's in, it's in my resume, but um, I, I was training pretty hard. Mm -hmm. And I, a friend of mine, uh, we, we, we did everything together, Nick Bender. Yeah. And he was in, we, we both archery hunted, we were big bow hunters, and we would go to archery tournaments where we do bow hunter, and then we would also do freestyle with the stabilizers. Yeah. And you know, it takes like, maybe four hours to do, or we call it a round of, of archery, but it's like playing a round of golf. Right. So every weekend we'd go to an archery tournament or a karate tournament, or, you know, they'd be at, one be at one end of the state, one be at the other end of the state. And finally what had happened is, is, is uh, Nick met a girl and he was gonna get married, and, and he said, George, I just can't keep this pace up anymore. So he said, let's flip a coin as far as what we're going to do. Yeah. So Nick flips a coin. He won the coin toss. I said, well, what are you going to do? And he said, well, he said, you know, he said, I'm sick of karate. <laughs> Probably because I was beating him <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at tournaments and stuff. And he says, so I'm, I'm really going to go the archery route. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that's good. I said, because I've hunted my whole life. I said, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go the, the martial arts route. So we both went two different directions. So Nick... Uh, he wound up the very next year winning the state championships in his division, you know, in Harrisburg. Yeah. And I wound up, I was away on, and I kept training hard. And I, I was actually down in vac and, uh, vacation at Ocean City, Maryland. Yeah. And I'm laying on the beach with my girlfriend, and I look up on one of those airplanes was going by dragging the, the thing behind it, and it said, 
World Karate Tournament. They kept going by, and finally, I, I mean, I, I was so antsy, I couldn't stand it. So I said to, to my girlfriend, I said, hey, I said, do you care if I walk over there and see what that is? And she says, no, go ahead, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, so I walk over there, and it turns out this was this World Championships. <laughs> So I don't I don't know I don't know what possessed me, but there was a buddy of mine that lived down there, and I I, I called him on the phone. I said, Hey, Greg, this is George Graham. He goes, Yeah, what are you doing? I said, Well, I said, Listen, I said I'm down here having these world championships, and I said, uh, I said I know you live around here. I said, Can I borrow your gi? Yeah. He goes, Well, sure. He says, As a matter of fact, I'm on my way to Ocean City right now. So believe it or not, he came. I borrowed his gi, and yeah. you know. Uh, I wasn't staying that long, you know, because fighting was the next day or whatever. So, but I wound up, I didn't have any weapons, so I put a gi on. I wound up competing in Kata, and I wound up taking fourth place. So, <laughs> I mean, just kind of off the cuff. I wasn't even yeah. even planning on it. So, so even then, the training paid off. Yeah, yeah. So, so, but, but then I wasn't even anywhere near the point of where I really was getting into it. Right. So then, I forget what year that was, and then um, I got a phone call from... Uh, Gary Michek, who was, was, this guy was an international, com well, national competitor, not international. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the first guys that ever did musical forms, and he was on the cover of Karate Illustrated several times. Okay. And he was in our system. So Gary said, hey, George, you know, I'm putting together a team to go to do nationals mm -hmm. uh, under NASCA, which NASCA, uh, that means the North American Sport Karate Association. Okay. So what happened is we put a team together, mm -hmm. And we trained all the time. I mean, every Saturday uh, we trained. We drove to Wilkes-Barre because that's where it was. And we trained for, we had to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning. And we usually trained till 1 or 2 every Saturday. So if we weren't there training, we were at a tournament. Yeah. And it didn't matter, rain, sleet, hail, snow, just <laughs> like the mailman. I mean, we, we trained, you know, constantly, constantly training. And, and it paid off because there was 10 of us. And everybody placed in the top ten in the nation. Yeah. You know, and I think uh, you know you read the thing. I think in the region I was like, or in the the nation I was like four, six and six, and in the region I was like one one and two or whatever it was. Right. In the whole United States, and that yeah. was in that was in 1994. Mm -hmm. Now what happened is is the the Hollywood because these tournaments were all over. I mean they were you know they had the uh, uh, oh gosh, the Diamond Nationals, the, you know, they, they were out in uh, Las Vegas, they had, oh, the Summer Winter Nationals, I mean, gosh, uh, I can't even think of all the different names, but, but, but there's quite a few, quite a few names uh, yeah. of these, these big tournaments, you know, so, so, and I did, like I said, I did, I did very, very well. Well, what would happen is Hollywood would come in, mm -hmm. and they would take the top competitors out and then they would they would uh, use them in Hollywood for stunt guys and all that stuff like oh. like Ho Young Pak and Su Young Pak they competed they were they did a lot of the stunts for the teenage ninja mutant turtle guys oh, really? and I you know you get to know all these guys because yeah. you're competing with them you know and of course you meet you know I met Seagal I met uh, uh, oh gosh uh, I never I never met Van Damme but I met Chuck Norris and just just all those guys you yeah know? it's kind of like a like, like that but but anyhow so um uh so what would happen is is i was basically paying for this out of my pocket mm -hmm. and i didn't have a sponsor so i went i work at merrill lynch so i went to merrill and i asked them about a sponsorship and it would it was probably costing me about 16 grand a year to compete okay. out of my pocket now you've heard of john paul mitchell you know the hair products yep. they have a team and they, they have a million dollars a year that they sponsored their karate people. Oh, wow. You know, just to get their name out and, and all this kind of thing. Well, once I started beating their guys, now all of a sudden they want me to be on their, on their team. You right. Know? So it's like, mm -hmm. eh, you know. But, but finally it got to a point, and, and you know, there was, a, there was one of the kids uh, that was, uh, I kind of took under my wing, and he was six years old when I took him under my wing, and then he, he got to be, uh, he was a senior, in, or, or he was in high school, and I said, but he was really good, and I said, look, I know you can't afford this, I said, I'm going anyhow, yeah. I said, so you can stay with me for free, you know, so I kind of let him, you know, and he, he's the guy that actually gave me that American flag, he's uh, retired from the, 
the army here in about well next month oh, wow. you know he he flew apache helicopters and all that kind of thing so i, I feel like it really helped him in his life you yeah. know things i can talk a little bit about that later mm -hmm. but uh but yeah so so um with with that that whole deal so so that's kind of really got me excited so then i i kept training harder and harder and harder and it got to a point where i mean i I kind of I kind of lost count. Yeah. <laughs> but I had I have somewhere over three thousand wins. Yeah. You know, not just trophies, but medals and all that kind of stuff. And you know, in in the I always said, boy, I'd, I'd like to go to the Olympics, but it really wasn't in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. What they had was uh, they had these World Games, which was the equivalent of a, of the Olympics. Yeah. And then uh, what we tried to get it in there. We've had representatives there, but. I don't know if you know how they do that, but what they no. do is if you're a sponsoring city, mm -hmm. you're allowed to to pick a sport. And you and in other words, like let's say if you want it to be surfboarding, right. okay, and the and the the Olympics is going to be held in Hawaii, you know, then okay, then you can pick that. Yeah. Or that's why there's some of this weird stuff, you know, that's in these is because those towns pick that particular sports. Okay. Well, nobody really, really picked martial arts, and you would think that they would have over the years. They picked wushu, mm -hmm. which is basically a, it's just a forms kind of a thing. Okay. And then later, I think it was held in Korea, and they did just a point fighting system with, with Korea where they did this, just, it was just points for kicking and punching and things. Yeah. But they didn't actually have the full contact karate, like, like they have at these these world games, right. you know. So so anyhow, so I knew about that, but it was just one of those. Well, hey, I did nationals, you know. I was I was you know top, you know, I was in the top ten in the nation, so I was pretty happy about that. And then one day I get a phone call from a guy, and he introduced himself. His name was Tony Abel, and Tony was uh, capped or he was coach of the United States karate team. Yeah. So he called me and he said, uh, George, you know, uh, yeah, and he introduced himself and he said, uh, we're putting together a team to represent the United States for the, the Team USA to go to, to the Olympics. Yeah. And it's going to be held in uh, Tomp, Siberia. Would you be interested in, in going? I'm like, heck yeah, why, <laughs> why wouldn't I be, you know? And, and I said, well, I said, you know, but I, I didn't know if I was good enough, you know what I mean? Because, yeah. I mean, you know. I mean, I was winning at tournaments, but you're a little, eh, I don't know if I was really that good. So I, I talked to my sensei and just different people, and they said, they said, yeah, definitely, definitely do it. Mm -hmm. So I said to him before, I said, well, why did you pick me? Mm -hmm. You know, out of these thousands of people out there, why did you pick me? Right. And he basically said, well, George, he said, we've been following your career for a very long time. And I said, my career, what do you mean? He says, well... He said, some people are good at fighting, some people are good at kata, some people are good at weapons. He says, you're good at everything. Right. And he says, well, we need that on the team. Yeah. And then he, he, so I had to go and I performed for him. I did some stuff and, and they said, oh yeah, you're definitely in. And do you want to be team captain? And I said, sure. Yeah. You know? So there was somewhere around 40 or 45 of the competitors that mm -hmm. were going to go. And there was two coaches, Bob Nino and, and Tony Abel. Mm -hmm. And what happened is, this was in 1999, yeah. the war in Kosovo had broken out, so basically Homeland Security or whatever it was put out a, you know, a, warning, a travel advisory, don't go to Russia, don't go to Siberia, blah, blah, blah. Right. So, and I, now you got to remember this now, so I trained for probably a year, I mean, I was pretty buff, you know, you, uh, up there in <laughs> one of those pictures, now I'm overweight. But, uh, I mean, but I was eating right, I was healthy, I mean, just really good. And, and I, was, I was ready to go, and, right. then, and then it's just like all of a sudden it kind of pulled the rug out from under, and I, I was really disappointed. But I liked the level where I was at, because mm -hmm. when I would go to a tournament, I'd walk in the ring, I, I knew I was going to win. Right. I knew it. I knew it. Yeah. I mean, I'd look at my competition, and it was just like I, I just had that feeling. I mean, you know, I knew I was going to win. And it, it's crazy, because people... If you're if you're really into your sport, no matter what it is, I call it the zone. Yeah. And I mean, when you're in the zone, I mean, it's tough to beat somebody who's in the zone. Right. I mean, it really truly is because it's it's just like I mean, you're so focused, and you're so 
in line with with everything i mean you you really you really got it going on and, and you generate an aura yeah and people can sense that they can feel that you know well and obviously it has a lot to do with the work that you put in leading up to it oh without well, question so. i mean yeah yeah you i mean you don't get anything for anything i mean you know i can't tell you how many tournaments i went to and didn't win anything yeah. you know i got beat up or you know or or whatever you know i mean i i was fortunate i mean i had a lot of broken toes and fingers you know, fat lips and black eyes, you know, but I never had any real serious injuries like knee injuries or back injuries or yeah. that kind of stuff. You know, lots of pulled muscles, broken ribs and stuff. But right. but it was, uh, you know, it, it, it was really something with uh, with that. So where was I going? Uh, so you um, not able to go oh, yeah. to the, uh, yeah. the so So course. what happened was um, we wound up then the next, uh, well, so I just kept training. Yeah, just because I, I really liked it. I was doing station training, which is which is pretty tough training, you know. So for the people that don't know that, that's where if I said to you, go over here and punch this bag as hard as you can. Oh, yeah, well, I can do that. All right, well, you punch that for two minutes or three minutes. Yeah. Well, after about 15 seconds, you're burnt out, <laughs> you know. But you got to keep punching it, yeah. you know. And then and then you get a minute break. Then, then just, you, you, okay, now I want you to go in there and I want you to you know, to kick that with a roundhouse kick, as many roundhouse kicks as you can with your right leg yeah. for two minutes straight, hard. Right. Then you get a minute break. Now go over there and do you know, as many push-ups as you can do in, a, in two minutes or three minutes. Yeah. You know, because everything was two, three-minute rounds. Mm -hmm. Well, you go through about three or four stations, you're spent. Yeah. You know, but by the time you get done with this training and you train and you do that for a year or so, I mean, you can get through that maybe twice doing that. I mean, so it, it really gets you pretty buff pretty quick. Yeah. So, so anyhow, so I got a phone call, I think it was the following December or January, and I think it was right after Christmas they called me, mm -hmm. and they said, hey, George, we're, we're putting a team back over to go to, to uh, it's going to be in St. Petersburg rather than Tomps, would you be interested in going? I'm like, heck yeah. yeah. And the guy hesitates, and I said, well, what are you, what are, what are you saying here? Yeah. He goes... Well, he said, you're the first person, he said, out of everybody we've called that was said they would go. <laughs> I said, he said, they said, aren't you scared? And I said, heck no. I said, this is a once-a-lifetime opportunity. I'm going. Yeah, you, know? you were prepared for this. Yeah, I was prepared. I said, I'm, <laughs> I'm going. And they are like, well, we'll have to get back to you. <laughs> it was one of those kind of things. So, so it was funny. So what they wound up doing is uh, there was one other competitor. His name was Ron Kiblish, and he was somewhere around Lee Heighton. Mm -hmm. So he was going, myself, uh, and the two coaches, Bob Dinow and, and Tony Abel. Mm -hmm. So we wound up, we wound up going to, to Russia. Now, then the tournament was held in, in uh, what they called the Hepidrome. And this is where the czars ran their horses. Right. Which was an interesting thing because it was a real long building, you know, in, a, in like old St. Petersburg, which is the old Leningrad. Yeah. So what happened was, is they, they normally have the opening ceremonies the night before, and they didn't have them. Mm -hmm. So they had them, you know, the very, the very next, uh, next night, mm -hmm. so, or at the end of that day. So what happened is, is Ron wound up fighting, and over there fighting, it's full contact. I right. mean, no gloves, bare knuckle. They don't even let you wear mouthpieces, but <laughs> when I... When I wound up fighting, I said, I'm wearing my mouthpiece, you know, because I had lost a tooth in football. But anyhow, so Ron, my partner, he, he wound up fighting the first day. I don't know how, but he wound up fighting, and he got knocked out. Yeah. And then he was just, he was out of it the whole time. I mean, the rest of it, he just lost his drive, everything. So, oh, so I was basically on my own, you know. Yeah. So anyhow, um, so what happened was the very first day, I wound up, competing in uh in forms mm -hmm. and i wound up or no it was weapons i'm sorry it was weapons okay and i wound up competing in caught in weapons well what happened is is that you had to be like i had like maybe five or six different weapons and then they didn't want you to use like if you tied well what they would do is they'd bring two people out Okay. Okay. So you do a cod, and this other person do a cod, and then show a hands in one way or another. So if you could use a different weapon each time, it was better right. rather than do the same cod over and over again. Because right. most people can only do one weapon. Well, I I could do like six or seven. So every time it came out, 
So I'm bouncing back and forth between rings, doing long weapons and short long weapons in one ring and short weapons in another ring. Oh man! You know, so to make a long story short, I wound up winning first place. Yeah. And when you win first place, you win a world title. Mm -hmm. So you know, so I wound up winning. Ron lost. So that was that particular day. Now then, it was a three day tournament. Okay. Now it's it's a it's a five day tournament. So what happened was is we get to the end of the day, and now they're going to have the opening ceremonies. Right. So they, they line us up and, and what they're doing is they, they line up so all the polit political dignitaries would come out first, then the coaches followed by the, you know, the, the, the um, all the competitors. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's difficult not too many people speak English, you know, so you got to find somebody and kind of hang around with them. Yeah. Because I didn't speak Russian. And uh, one of the, uh, I went to, the guy's name was Nikolai Smirnova, Smirnov, yeah. who ran the tournament. And I said, well, where should we go? So he grabs us and he puts us at the front of the line of the competitors. Yeah. So Ron was carrying a, a sign that said USA in Russian. Mm -hmm. And I had my bow staff that I had won with that day and I had some duct tape with me and an American flag. Yeah. So I took the duct tape out of my bag and I, I tied it around the bow staff and the American flag so I could hold an American flag. Yeah. So you gotta remember, picture this now. This was, you know, in, in Russia mm -hmm. and Americans haven't been there in a long time, right. so we were the first American team to go. Yeah. So that so picture this. There, I mean, I still get chills. I mean, they're they're playing the Olympic music. We're marching around the arena, and as soon as we get in front of the crowd, the people start yelling, "USA, USA, USA!" I mean, I I, I still the the yeah, hair. I absolutely. mean, it, I mean, it stands up in the back of my neck, and I get the the chills. And I realized they weren't cheering for the USA, they were cheering for me. Yeah. I mean, it is the most humbling experience I ever had in my life. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it's just like, it brings tears to your eyes. I mean, and these th these little kids would be on the side, and they didn't want anything. Yeah. They just wanted to come out and touch you. Yeah. They just wanted to touch you. They just wanted to be near they, you. Yeah, they just, and it, it was just like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm not worthy. I mean, it's <laughs> like, oh, holy crap. I mean, but you talk about a humbling experience and... Anybody that an athlete of of that caliber, right. and I'm talking about you know, whether it's football or or basketball or whatever it is, the, the people that are at that level, when somebody does that and you start getting standing ovations, I mean, right. it, it it's very very humbling, Unreal. you know, for for true athletes, it yes, is, for true athletes, absolutely. So so I wound up, you know, so that that was just that was unbelievable, and then. And then the next day, I competed in in forms, mm -hmm. and I I tied for a world title, and then wound up. I think I lost by like a eighth of a point or something, so I wound up with second. So yeah. I got a silver. And then the third day is when the fighting came, the, the kumite came, and like I said, they could make a Rocky movie out of this. <laughs> it, it, it was uh, we were uh, so Ron. They had individual fighting first. Well, yeah. Ron, he didn't do forms. He didn't do kata. He didn't do fight. I mean, after that, that after thing, because he got yeah. knocked out. So, anyhow, so I, I wind up going out, and, and I'm fighting full contact. But I have my equipment on. So the guy comes out, and, oh, you got to take that off. So I take off my foot pads, take off my shin pads. He says, you must take off your gloves, take off my gloves. I had hand wraps, take those off. And then he goes like this. Yeah. And I had a mouthpiece in. Yeah. And he goes, I said, no. Yeah. I said, I broke a tooth off in football. I said, I'm not, I'm going to wear a mouthpiece or I'm not fighting. Yeah. So they, everything stops. He goes over and talks to the judges. Nikolai comes over and says, okay, you can wear your mouthpiece. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we're out there, uh, we're out there, they're fighting. Mm -hmm. And what happens in, in Kumite normally is you get down to the last four people. Okay. And the two winners fight for first and second. The two losers fight for third. Okay. okay. Well, what happened is, is in the division that I was in, and I fought a lot of fights, I'm fighting their champion. Okay. It, this is in the finals. Yeah. And we should have fought second, but it's just the way that it came out. We wound up fighting first. Mm -hmm. So I'm fighting their champion, who they left out of prison to fight me. Oh. <laughs> now, 
if you were taught teaching or training in martial arts up until about 10 years before that, they put you in prison. So that's, this guy was put in prison for that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But they left him out to fight me. Right. right. So I'm fighting this guy. And, I mean, and he was really cracking me. I mean, like, like, like when I came home, my body was black and blue from head to toe. And it looked like, like I was black underneath my shirt. Yeah. You could see it looked like I had a tattoo or something. Yeah. But... I would go like that, and I was bleeding through my bruises, and my hand would be bloody. Oh, my no God. No kidding. No yeah. kidding. I mean, it was, I got pictures, I think, of that. You can ask anybody here, because I <laughs> worked at Merrill at the time. And anyhow, so this guy are fighting. We're going at it. Well, finally, we're in overtime, mm -hmm. and I actually thought I'd beat him, but I'm not going to beat the hometown champion. You know? right, so, yeah. so he wound up he wound up beating me. Yeah. So now... Uh, now all I had a chance at was third place, so I wound up fighting a guy for third place, and I, I beat him. So I wound up taking a, a, a bronze there. Yeah. And then this guy went on, and he fought some other guy, and the guy kept kicking him in the groin, kicking him in the groin, and and he, because you're allowed to do leg sweeps and things, but you can't kick somebody in the groin. Yeah. And finally, this guy just got mad, and boom, he punched him, and he split his nose wide open, oh where. I mean, just like a flap, and yeah. the cartilage, you can see the cartilage there, and the blood just dripping. So they stop the fight and just take, like, scotch tape, you know, or that white tape, you yeah. know, they put it on his nose, but it could, wouldn't could stick because he was all bloody. Right. And they kept slipping and sliding on the floor because all the blood. So finally they, they wound up stopping the fight. Right. You know, it was just like, good Lord. And I'm thinking... That could have been me, <laughs> you know, but but fortunately the guy liked me. So so then uh, they had what they called team fighting, mm -hmm. and originally it would have been Ron Kiblish myself, and then we would get another guy. Yeah. Now when they do team fighting in the United States, it's like if you and I are on a team and there's another guy. If you win, I win. The third guy doesn't have to fight. Okay. Okay. Well, at the World Games, it's not like that. At the World Games. You fight, I fight, and the other guy fights, and it's cumulative points. Okay. Okay. So I wanted to keep fighting because I was like really, you know, I was I was on a, on yeah. a high, you know, and uh, so Nikolai said, "Do you want to continue fighting?" I said, "Yeah." So what they did is they teamed me with the guy that their champion who won. Yeah. So it was their champion, me, and some other Russian guy. Yeah. And instead of calling the team Soviet Union or United States, we called it Union. Yeah. That was the name of the team. Oh, nice. Which is pretty cool. So to make a long story short, it's the third day of the tournament. It's a Sunday night. Mm -hmm. It's midnight. There's probably 8,000 people still there watching the tournament. Yeah. It's on, you know, they only have like one channel in Russia. Yeah. You know, and it goes all over Russia, all over Asia, and here we are. Yeah. So what happened is we won all of our fights. It's down to the very last round. Yeah. Um, the score was dead even. And I'm the last guy to fight. Yeah. And it's midnight. Yeah. If I win, we win the gold medal and a world title. Right. If I lose, we get, you know, we go home with uh, with the silver. Yeah. So, anyhow, so I wound up, I think I was fighting some Korean. And we're going at it and at it. And I'm, I'm getting the best of him, you mm -hmm. know. So, finally, either we, we, I think we went out of bounds or something like that. And so we go out of bounds, and the bell rings, and I put my hands down. And as soon as I did, that guy cold cocked me. I mean, boom. And, I, and it was one of those, my head was spinning, and wham, I went down. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll never forget this as long as I live. And Tony Abel, the coach, or the, the captain, came running over to me, and he said, he looked me, he grabbed my hold of my hands, he looks me right in the eyes, and he said, George, George, you've done more than any American ever has at these World Games. He, yeah. says, he says, don't get up. Yeah. Don't get up. And the more he talked, the more pissed off I got. Right. Yeah. And when I went down, everybody was cheering that I got knocked down, you know. But but they like to see the a turnaround kind of a thing. Yeah. And the more he talked, the more pissed off I got. And they're giving me the ten count. So and he's counting. So I just looked at him. I can't swear on here. Yeah. But I said I looked him right now and I said I didn't come here to freaking lose. Right. So I stood up like that and everybody cheered. Ah! They all went crazy. I went over there and beat the crap out of this guy, and we wound up winning a gold medal. Oh man! So, so that was that was the first the first year. Yeah. Now, normally, what they do, 
is if once you win, it's not like the United States, you know, you're only as good as you are today. Right. You know, when you go to these world competitions, when you win, they kind of put you on a pedestal mm -hmm. and now it's somebody else's turn. Right. Which is actually kind of neat, you yeah. know, that they do that. But the United States doesn't like that. So what they did is, you know, I, I knew I could do better because mm -hmm. when I went there, I had two broken fingers. Yeah. You know, so I knew I wasn't up to my best as best as I could be. Right. So I wound up going back the next year, and as soon as I got off the plane, Nikolai's there to meet me in the airport, and he goes like this, and he unrolls this poster, and I was poster boy for the tournament <laughs> <laughs> with that kick that I have on the, yeah. on the, on the thing, which I can show you. Yeah. So, so I was like all pumped and everything, you know. So anyhow, so when I wound up going to the tournament, and now... Instead of the tournament being held at the at the Hepidrome, it was it was held uh, at one of the the stadiums where they do like the big concerts and things like that. Right. And this thing, I don't know how many people could hold, probably sixty, hundred thousand people, whatever. Yeah. And the tournament at this point now had grown that you know you, there'd be anywhere from fifteen to twenty thousand spectators oh, right. going to these tournaments. Yeah. So I went back, and the second time I was there, I won. Uh, three first places, three golds, yeah. and, a, and a bronze, yeah. you know, so now I had five world titles in two years, yeah. and so for the next, and then, like I said, they said, we don't really want you to compete right. you know, anymore, you know, now is your time, so what I did is every year I, for the next, uh, up until three years ago, I went every year and did the opening ceremonies for the World Games, I was poster boy for seven or eight years, however many years it was, right. and then I believe in... Uh, and 2013 was the last time I competed, and you know I can tell you about that. Yeah, so we'll get into then. Um, yeah. Obviously, like this is just such a crazy, you know, series of events from just the beginning and oh, all the work nuts. that you put in, and nuts. then you know to have it rewarded is just awesome. Um, and not only in those circumstances uh, that you've described, I mean, it's just it's unreal. Um, and then as far as like you are getting into then, um, you know, the final. The final fight and the final, um, you know, co competition that you did in it. Um, you know, let's let's get into. Well, it and yeah. So uh, here here's what happened. I was there and and when I was there, I mean, you you are actually an ambassador of your country. Right. So you don't drink, you don't party, you really don't do any of that stuff. Yeah. You know when you're competing, you know, now when you're there as a spectator, whatever, it's a little different, you know, so they, of course, obviously, they like to drink vodka, and it's pretty good, by the way, <laughs> not that I had any, but yeah. it's actually pretty good, so anyhow, so we go to, I'm going to, Nikolai takes us out to dinner, mm -hmm. and there's probably about 20 or 30 of us, and uh, Nikolai says to me, oh, judge, judge, he called me judge, yeah. He says, uh, I have to tell you, he said, uh, he says, you are, you're competing. Yeah. I looked at him, I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> he goes, George, you're competing. Yeah. And I said, Nikolai, I'm not competing. I said, you're lucky I even brought a gi, you yeah. know, which is your uniform, right. you know? And he goes, no, George, you're, you're competing. Yeah. And I said, well, what am I supposed to be competing in? He goes, weapons. I said... I didn't bring any weapons. He said, I'll find some for you. <laughs> you know, and I'm like looking at him, I said, are you serious? And he goes, yeah. So he reaches over and I just happened to be on the cover of, uh, of Budo Magazine, which is the largest martial arts magazine in the world. Yeah. I was just on a cover of it right. for doing weapons, you know. And all of a sudden he grabs this magazine and he goes like this. He, yeah. showed, he says, I already told everybody you were coming. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you dog. <laughs> so here it is. I said, Nikolai, I said, I said I'm, I'm not ready to compete. Yeah. And he goes, he said, well, you're training, aren't you? And I said, yeah, but not world competition, for God's sakes. Yeah. You know, he says, oh, you'll do fine. I'm like, Nikolai, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> so it's like, good Lord. So, you know, so now immediately... You know, I go into competition mode, right. you know, quit eating, quit drinking, quit doing everything. <laughs> mindset. So, yeah, the mindset. And it's just like, oh, my gosh. I, and, I mean, all kinds of thoughts are running through my head. I'm like going, oh, geez, you're going to make an idiot out of yourself. Yeah. So I said, what day am I supposed to compete? And he said it'd be on Sunday, which was the last day of the tournament. Yeah. So now where it was a, initially a three-day tournament, now it's a five-day tournament. So this was on Friday. So I had like five days. Yeah. 
So the very next day, I'm a, the first one at the tournament before it even opens. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, and I think I, because I, I was going to, I, I guess all I, before where I was using multiple weapons, this one was just a bow staff. Yeah. So, so I, uh, I actually practiced in the hotel. I took a, I took a broom and I unscrewed the thing out of the, <laughs> out of the bottom of the broom. And I yeah. went up, you know, in my room, because the rooms were so small, they were, you know, about this size. Right. And I went into the hallway or anywhere where I could go. And I, I just kind of practiced and went through things. And uh, so next morning, I'm at the tournament before it even opens. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I go in, the first thing I did, I start buying up weapons at the, you know, at the different booths, you know. Yeah. And I just, I just said, uh, hey, Nikolai, is there a room somewhere where I can just go get warmed up, you know. So I go up and I went up in these rooms and just yeah. got warmed up. And I did that every day for the next couple of days until the till the tournament so finally on the last day mm -hmm. uh they call me up they make this big announcement everything stops at the tournament it's just like oh god so they're doing this competition i i don't know how many people were were in my division maybe like 35 or something like that yeah so i had pretty good placement i was towards the end so you know you kind of get the butterflies out and i went out and i i did my bow form and i wound up getting first place and won my sixth world title yeah and after that i just said that's it. I'm done. I said, don't ever do that to me again. So your your last world title then was on five days of training. <laughs> well, I mean, I have been training, but, but and it might not even been that. I mean, yeah. it was just I had to, you know, you want to keep going over it. Right, so you, you want to be in that mental mindset yeah, leading exactly. up to it. But that's exactly. all you had there, But it was, so. but, yeah, I mean, but I was like, oh. And then, you know, I, so then after that, and, and once you compete at that level, mm -hmm. It's very difficult to go to local tournaments and things like that. I yeah. mean, you go to these places, and I mean, I'm a very humble guy, you know. But I mean, when you go there, I mean, you're, you're, I mean, they put you on a pedestal. I mean, right. you know, you're like everybody bows you, and you're. I mean, it's the red carpet, and this and that, and like, right. he, like I say, in the United States, people. Yeah. You know, well, and know. and like you said, I mean, it's it's one of those things where you're <clears throat> representing the U.S. Um, yeah. So to be able to do it at that level is just. Unreal. Well, and, and that's that's exactly right, because we took a couple teams over, mm -hmm. and we had to have that talk with them and just say, hey, guys, you know, you're representing the United States of America. You're ambassadors of your country. Right. So, you know, get your act together. Here, you're not doing anything. Right. You know, we'll yank you right off the team. You know, and a couple of them we had to scold. Huh. You know? Yeah. So, um, winning that last title then, mm -hmm. um, what did... The, what was the emotion behind it? I mean, I know that it's it's probably along the same lines of you know winning the others. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you I'll tell you what 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 that that was, and it was very again it's very you don't even you don't think of it like a it's not that kind of a thing that you think of it like it's a world championships yeah. if you know what I mean it, it's like I always wanted to be the best that I could do mm -hmm. and if I rewarded for it fine if I'm not that's okay as long as I know I did the best that I could do right but this reminds me is is back in and I'm not sure of the year uh, I won the Kelly Cup mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania yeah and if you know, if the people that don't know what that is, that's the highest award the state of Pennsylvania gives to an amateur athlete. Mm -hmm. And I had probably won 50 state titles over the course of going to the Keystone Games. Mm -hmm. And I won the Kelly Cup this one year. Well, when I won it, uh, I was supposed to go down to meet the governor and they were going to give me this award. And, you know, so I asked my parents to go yeah. and, and my sister. And I. I didn't really think too much about it. I thought you just went in and shook the guy's hand and he gave you a certificate and this trophy and that yeah. was a deal. <laughs> well, when I go there, I find out it's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, and there was a whole auditorium full of people and every single first place champion from Pennsylvania was there. Yeah. The, the first place champs. Yeah. And then there's all these political dignitaries and the governor and all these people. And I'm like, going, oh, my word. You know? <laughs> so and this was all about honor and me, you know, yeah. so I'm like going, good God, you know. So and this is kind of the feeling, you know, and you'll, you'll get where I'm going with this. Yeah. So we go up there and, and they said all these these different things. And uh, and actually, I have this on tape, you know, and I'll never forget Steve Capelli, who was our, our state representative at that time mm -hmm. when he was doing the introduction. He says, he says, George, he says, this is probably the, the only thing you haven't won. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was pretty funny. Yeah. So it got to the point where I had to get up and say something. Mm -hmm. And I said, I didn't know if I was supposed to say anything or not. I said, I don't know if I am, but I said, I'm going to say something. 
Yeah. So I got out and I was in my 40s and early 40s and I looked out in the room and I saw all these faces of these young kids mm -hmm. and and I'm talking like teenagers, you know, like like probably, you know, 15, 16, 17 up to I don't even know if any of them were over 20, you know, yeah. they were just young kids, but right. they were all state champs. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what I was going to say. So I'm looking at these kids and then finally it just hit me and I said you know, I, I said, all you people here are champions. Mm -hmm. And you all know what it takes to become a champion. And I said, just like I do. I said, uh, you know, with, with the world championships that I, I, I won. And I said, you know, I can teach anybody how to do it. Mm -hmm. I can, just as you can, right. whether it's swimming or basketball or whatever your sport is. Mm -hmm. And I said, I can shave years off of your training because I've made those mistakes, right. you know, just like you all have. You know, now the reason I hold my hand up here and I switch my grips is because I got broken ribs from not having my hand down. I got black eyes from not having my hand up. Right. So if you're smart enough, you, you get that. Mm -hmm. But if you don't get hit, it, there's a little bit, bit more to it, you know. So, but, so, but I, can, I can show everybody the shortcuts. I can tell them how to get there. But then I finally wound up, I got to the point and I said, but the one thing none of us can teach is I can't teach heart, I can't teach soul, mm -hmm. and I can't teach passion. Mm -hmm. Those are three things you can't teach. You gotta, you gotta want it. Right. You know, uh, when I was in high school, I got picked to go to the Air Force Academy, and the guys came and interviewed me from the academy, and they said, uh, they said, um, you know, what do you think? And I said, well, I said, I think I could take all this stuff that the, the you know that you guys get, but I said I don't know if I'm smart enough. They said how bad do you want it? Yeah. Well, I wanted it pretty bad. Yeah. You know, so that's that's what I'm saying. I mean, not with, with the Air Force, but I mean with with this. I mean, I mean, I, I wanted it. Yeah. I mean, I really wanted it. You know, and I, and you drove yourself to to that point. And I, I'm a very self motivated poor person, mm -hmm. and I would be training and training and training hours. I mean, hours and hours and hours every day, constantly. You know, I'd go home at lunchtime and train. Yeah. You know, and I'd be running or I'd be doing something. And I can't tell you, like right across the street here, the guy, there used to be a, a, a hairdressing place over there. And it was the only place I could go late at night. Yeah. And they had a, an attic up there and they would let me use this attic. And I'd go up there and I'd train for an hour and a half, you know, maybe at midnight or before that. And I'd train. Yeah. And I'd come down the steps. I'd get to the door and I'd stop and I'd go, somebody's training harder than I am. Yeah. So I'd turn around and go right back up and work out for another half hour. Right. Now I did that all the time. Yeah. You know, so so I guess that's kind of a long way around the horse, you know. But but that that was the feeling it was like with that with that last winning that last title. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that are self proclaimed masters mm -hmm. or whatever, or self proclaimed in, in lots of sports, but when you're recognized by your peers yeah. that that's that's kind of a it's like they have these hall of fames i mean the very first hall of fame i was i was and i'm in, in 10 different ones numerous times uh but the very first hall of fame that i i was 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 in it wasn't so much being in the hall of fame as it was being in with those guys that i respected right and really th over the years you know the true pioneers mm -hmm. in, in the industry you know I, I looked at these guys and I went wow for me to be honored at that same level that they are right. that was the honor that right. was that was the you know like holy cow but then to go to a tournament of international competition and you find that recognition it's very very rewarding and very satisfying mm -hmm. you know and you know and and it's it's like I say, there, there's, you know, I was one of those people, I mean, some of my friends, oh, this is my best buddy, we grew, went into second grade together, or we grew up and blah, blah, well, I never had that, because my dad was in the military, so yeah. we were constantly on the move, moving around all the time, but in martial arts, I found that camaraderie, yeah. that you all had a, had a purpose, you all, uh, you know, everybody was of the same mindset, so there was none of this political baloney that's going on. And, and it was like, because we all had, it didn't matter if you were from Russia or you were from Iran or you were from 
wherever. I mean, you know, every time I see it, hey, George, how you doing? You know, I mean, there was none of that. No right. hostilities, nothing, you know. Oh. Bec- and, and it was funny because when we did some dem- demonstrations at the U.S. Embassy and also at the Russian Embassy, mm-hmm. and it was stated from, I think, the president of the Russian Embassy that he said, you guys have done more for relations between Russia and the United States than any political person could have ever done. Unreal. You know, because yeah. we are, you're there and you're, you know, you put your best face on, yep. you know, for everything. And, and it's like, I mean, I had probably 500 or a thousand of those posters there that I would go and I'd sign my name and I'd give them to the kids. And, yeah. and one year we took a team there mm-hmm. and one of the girls that was there did a musical form as a demonstration. And she had one of those big boom boxes, you know, and there was a little boy there. Mm-hmm. This is just pretty, pretty crazy. This little boy, and he was just in awe, and he would follow her around. So the day that we were leaving, we went, or the last day of the tournament, she was there, and she had already done the, her competition, won first place. And she said, i got to find that little boy. Yeah. I said, what? She says, I'm going to give him this tape player. Yeah. And I looked at her, I said, really? And she says, yeah. So we found this little boy. I don't know how we found him out of freaking <laughs> 10,000 or 20,000 people, but right. we found this little boy. And she gave him that boom box. And you want to see somebody jump out of their socks. Right. This kid, I never saw anybody so excited. This kid just <laughs> went, I mean, you could see it in his face. And he was just like, oh, I mean, I thought he was going to pass out. <laughs> I mean, and it was it was just speechless. And yeah. he wound up, he took off his black belt mm-hmm. and he gave it to her. Oh, wow. I mean, and for a kid that had absolutely nothing right. to give his black belt, you know, and this kid was good. He was a first place winner and, you know, and everything. He was probably 10 years old or something. Yeah. And he wound up giving her that, that black belt. I mean, it was, so there's lots of, yes, it, it's it's neat winning and all that, but there's all this other stuff that goes on yeah. behind the scenes that people don't really so realize. Much more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and I made a saying up years ago and I said, uh, it goes like this, the, the higher you go, the less you know. Yeah. Which is true, right. you know, because then you, when you get to that point that now you are a black belt or you're a master, or you're a grandmaster, it's like, geez, I don't know that. Now I gotta learn that. <laughs> <laughs> There's just so much more to, yeah. to learn, you know. Hmm. Unreal. Um, well, I guess the the last question then uh, would be, what would you say would be the number one thing that the the sport of karate has taught you? Um, discipline. Yeah. When when I was in. Uh, like I said, I was in martial arts in, in high school, mm-hmm. and co- or, or not high school, in college, mm-hmm. and then I came came home, and I, I did it. And I worked at a savings and loan for probably six or seven years, yeah. and then the opportunity came to go to Merrill Lynch, and so I, I grabbed it. And what happened is, is at Merrill Lynch, you have to take what they call the general securities exam, which is a six-hour exam. It's like yep. taking a law exam. Yeah. And it's, uh, there's like three hours in, in the first part of it, and then they give you like a half hour break and then another three hours. And it's mm-hmm. supposed to be easy, hard, and then get easy, easy, hard, then get easy. Well, mine started out hard, and the whole thing was hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, but it was funny because I was living at home at my parents' house trying to save money. Yeah. And I was sitting at the table, and my, I'll never forget this as long as I live. My dad would, like, he'd, he'd get up in the morning, and I'd be sitting at the table studying. Yeah. And he'd go to bed at night and see me sitting at the table studying. He said, he looked at, he goes, George, he says, I've never seen you open up a book. He <laughs> said, the whole time going through high school, he said, he said, I can't, he's, he, he was just impressed with me sitting there studying. Yeah. But the thing of it was, is Merrill Lynch only wanted top people. And if you flunked your GSC back then, they didn't give you a second chance. Yeah. So I figured I got one shot at it. So I just studied, but there's no way in the world that I could have sat there and studied the way that I did if it wasn't for martial arts training. Because yeah. you got to remember, I was, I was probably eight nine years out of school. Right. You know, so you know when you're when you're in school, you're still in study mode. You know, kind of right. for a while. But once you get out of it and you're working and everything, it's very difficult to discipline yourself to do that. But I I, I attribute you know martial arts to that. But but martial arts really teaches you you focus. And, and that, that helped me. I mean, I see it with, like, I, I still teach to this day. I, you know, I have my own school, and I, I teach. I'm the head instructor. And when you teach these, I notice this with these young kids. Mm-hmm. And I've never had a discipline problem. 
Yeah. Because people, a lot of times people bring their kids in for them to get discipline. Right. But I don't treat kids like kids. I treat them like adults. I always have. Yeah. And, you know, and what you do is, like, if somebody's out of line, you, you say, uh, oh, somebody's out of line. We're all going to do push-ups. We're all going to do sit-ups. Mm -hmm. Well, after the tenth time, the kids get sick of it. Then you finally let it slip who it was. You know, it was little Johnny. Well, now I don't have to do anything. The kids take care of it because they put peer pressure on them. Right, yeah. So then little Johnny now kind of, you know, kind of gets back in line. But but it's, it's interesting because, uh, again, it's that discipline, it's respect, mm -hmm. it's all that stuff. You know, so martial arts is, is great training for... For kids, I even taught a couple classes at Lawless Sock High School. I did that for three years. I taught a yeah. martial arts course there. Unreal. So. Awesome. Well, I definitely appreciate the uh, the stories. Uh, the, yeah. The, uh, oh, I got lots of <laughs> the information that you shared. I mean, your journey your journey is uh, is unreal, um, mm -hmm. and I really appreciate that. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the content as well. Um, and if you did, please like and subscribe. And remember, whatever it is that you do today, approach it with the mindset of, "Is this my final play?" Thanks a lot. Thank you.